and the banks are having trouble. So my whole philosophy on this, Gary, is that for me, no debt is what's keeping my mental health and my money safe. It's not for everybody. I get it. But um, I just feel so bad for the people struggling with these things because that's where I was. I totally understand it. All right, Joel Friedland, how are you doing today? I'm uh, very excited to have you here. Um, I've, I've seen some of your previous podcasts, and I know we've had a, we've had a conversation before. And you're just a wealth of knowledge, and I thought it'd be uh, great for me to sit down and have a conversation with you and to to share your your knowledge, your insights, and and what do you think of what's happening with the market? So, so how are you? How are you doing? I'm doing great, and I have watched some of your podcasts. So you're you're good to watch while I'm doing my elliptical machine. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Well, I appreciate that. That's the first time somebody's uh, watched me doing the elliptical machine, at least that they've told me anyway. So <laughs> I appreciate that. But, um, you know, why don't we kind of maybe dive into who Joel Friedland is, what you've done, uh, and, and how you really kind of got started into, into real estate investing? Sure. So I was very lucky at age 22, I got a job working for a family in the Chicago area where I lived. I was a graduate of the University of Michigan. And by the way, we have a good football team this year. Awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, we did, we did last year. Um, so the family, their last name is Podolsky. And they were in 1981, which was 43 years ago, one of the top three industrial real estate owners in the Chicago area. They had 6 million square feet, probably about a half a billion dollars worth of industrial properties, 84 buildings. And someone introduced me to the family. Uh, and I went to work for the father, the two sons, and the daughter. And I was a leasing agent. And in 1981, when I started, interest rates were 17%. And of their 84 buildings, they had 10 vacancies. And they knew that from my interview that I was a people person and could do sales and leasing. And they said, your job, young man, is to fill up our 10 vacancies as fast as you can in this bad economy. Okay. So I went cold calling in industrial parks. That's what I thought to do. And I parked my car in front of a building on industrial drive, which is there's always an industrial drive in industrial real estate. Yeah. And I went up and down the street, stopping in and not taking no for an answer. I would walk in the door and ask for the owner of the company. And when I got to see the owner, we'd tour their manufacturing or distribution operation and then go sit in, in the president's office. And I'd say, how would you like to move down the street? I have a vacant building. Right. And I filled up nine of the buildings uh, that first year. We had one stubborn vacancy that we couldn't lease. And I learned the business from the Podolskis. I worked for them for 10 years. It was the greatest experience. Steve Podolsky, who was my mentor then, is now my partner on a lot of deals, is one of the greatest guys ever. Brilliant real estate guy, super good on all the details. And he taught me the business. That's he awesome. He likes to kid around. Yeah. <laughs> he taught me everything that I know, but not everything he knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, there's two things that I got out of that, what you just said. So one, I think it's the importance of having a mentor. Mentorship is so important. Um, and then and then number two, uh, I think also to the importance of boots on the ground and 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 working hard during hard or difficult times. You know, I'm actually in the process now. Uh, I, I hired a couple of new uh, agents on my team and they were asking me like, Gary, do you think now is a good time to get into the market? Because, you know, obviously with everything happening and high interest rates, I'm like, yes, now yeah. is a good time because you'll know what you need to do during difficult times. Because after difficult times, always come good times again. But then if you understand how to work during those difficult times, you'll know whether it be what to do or to at least bring people on and into your business or company to show them what needs to be done. Yeah, I think it's great to start at a time of adversity because first of all, then you you realize that there is adversity. Some of the people who started in the past 15 years don't understand what adversity is or how to handle it and have made assumptions that things that are good will always be good. And that's just not how it works. 
it's biblical that if you the story of Joseph uh, in the in the the coat of many colors, he he uh, ended up having a dream that there were going to be seven good years and seven bad years uh, of of growing corn, and right. that's how it works. Usually, there's a cycle. It can be seven years, ten years, but it goes up and down. And working from the standpoint of adversity in the beginning allows a person to realize that adversity is something that will end up happening and you have to know how to handle it. And that's the biggest issue. And mentorship to me is the best way to learn how to handle yourself, whether in times of adversity or times of rapid growth. So I know not only at Steve Podowski, but over the years, uh, I've had at least a dozen great mentors. And many of them, when I syndicate properties today, many of them are on my advisory committee where before we buy a building, I run it by them and ask them to throw their hardest questions at me before we buy a property and before we write the check. Right. Those are, those are mentors and they're still in my life. And now I mentor a number of people as well. So there's a lot of, what do they call that? Uh, passing it down or paying it forward. Yeah, that's awesome. That's good to do that, right? Now, so, so, you, so you helped him with leasing these properties. He then saw that you did a, a, an incredible job with it. Um, but, but how did you actually now get into then acquiring property? You must have saw something where you're like, okay, hold on a second. I'm leasing and I'm helping him out and I'm getting some money, but what, was that where the wealth building was or there was obviously something else to it that you saw that, uh, that got you intrigued into the purchase inside of it? Well, I looked at the Podowskis and I was a bit analytical and I said, why are they so wealthy? And it's not because they were brokers. Uh, although maybe in the beginning, mm-hmm. Bill's dad made his money being a broker, which allowed him to become an owner. But I said, gee, they're as wealthy as they are. How do they have a half a billion dollars worth of real estate? And it, it's because they were owners and not the, the, the magic of owning and having properties go up in value and managing them well really was their secret. And I said, I've got to do that. I'm not going to just continue only being an agent. So I went to them. I went to Milt, the dad and Steve, the son. And I said, guys, I want to start doing some syndicating of my own stuff. I'm 30 years old and it's time for me to do that. And they said, well, we'll back you We'll put up a third of the money. We'll introduce you to our investors. You have to go meet them and convince them when you find a deal to do your deal. We're not going to do it for you. And then you need to put your own money in and you need to bring in your own investors so you have skin in the game. Right. Went out and I found my first deal and I put it together. It was uh, totally all cash, no no debt, no mortgage, 560000 And I raised money including putting my own 20,000 in and 20,000 from everybody. Okay. And that was in 1989. And I still own the building with that group. And that group is full of people who are advisors and mentors and friends. And then I went on and did an additional 99 because we've had a hundred buildings so far. We just hit our hundredth industrial uh, acquisition. Wow. And uh, I'm a syndicator now, and I still do brokerage for clients that I love, who I trust, who trust me. Uh, I I was just in Canada and worked on a brokerage deal for the Bradford Exchange, the collectibles company that's based here in Chicago, but that has a warehouse in London, Ontario. And I had to negotiate on behalf of Bradford as their agent with the landlord who lives in Toronto, their family has owned the building since I met them 40 years ago. Right. And every five years, I help negotiate the renewal of their lease. And so oh. I get to come to London. It's great. That's awesome. So you're working on both sides of the border. That's amazing. Now, what happened during 2008 for you? Did you get through that unscathed or did you actually... Um, you know, experience uh, difficulties during that time, like many people did. And and what maybe kind of led up to that? Was there any kind of overconfidence or do you think that the market could never go down like it did? 
Well, it, it's a combination of factors. First of all, 2008 was the worst recession that I've ever seen. And I went through four downturns. It was the worst of the four. And unfortunately for me, I had become really successful up until 2008. And I didn't have the foresight to sell everything in 2007. So I had 50 industrial buildings, 200 investors. And when the market tanked in September of 2008, I was in a position where I had seven banks and I had um, multiple loan guarantees. And a bunch of vacancies started to happen because companies couldn't afford to pay the rent and were downsizing. Uh, and it was really tough. And I went into a very bad emotional state of despair. Okay. And I wish I hadn't gone into it, but I spiraled into it because things were so bad that I didn't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. It was a long tunnel and we all knew that. Right. Was that your comfy couch there in the back? Is that a reminder? I was on that couch, as you know. Yeah. And I, I couldn't get off. I was really in tough shape, but I got up and I dusted myself off and I did an analytical study of what was it that went wrong. <laughs> and I figured out I have to do something that nobody else does. And I'm going to guess that my debt free strategy, which really was a result of the analytics of what went wrong in 2008. I'm probably the only syndicator in North America that does primarily, almost exclusively, no mortgage, no debt, all cash investments. And some people think it's stupid and some people think it's smart. But the people who think it's smart are generally people who are not trying to get rich in real estate. They're already wealthy and they're protecting their assets by having a strategy, at least for some of their money, where there's no debt and what happened in 2008 can't happen because there's no bank. Yeah, you know what? I, I like that you're saying that because, again, I, I think over the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of real estate investors uh, that have now become gurus in like a year and a half, two years, and just got completely uh, wiped out. And, and I think people had this idea that real estate investing was easy and that it just kept going up. And, uh, and I think that lesson that you, that you went through in 2008 was something that, you know, at the time wasn't good for you to go through, but you look back at it and you say, man, that was one of the best lessons that I could have probably ever received. And, uh, and myself and a couple other partners were looking to now move into the U S to purchase apartment building. And that's the exact same conversation that we've had is, um, we should have very little debt or none at all. And, and that's not a conversation that a lot of people really want to do because it's always about return on investment. And, you know, you got to try and get those up to like 25, 30%. But you also, you know, you've got people that just want to protect their, their wealth and, uh, and, and they don't want to be caught in risky situations or speculating. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and the thing that I've learned is that the wealthiest people, own a lot of property with no debt. They're yeah. not, not in syndications. They just own property. I have bought more properties from families that own businesses that occupied the buildings that I buy. Their company was in the building and then they sold the company to a private equity group. And the company that was that took over, the, the management that took over would lease the buildings back from the family that used to own the company. So now uh, I've got an example. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a company uh, called Tampico. And uh, when you're in Mexico, you'll, you'll see their juices. They're all over the world, but um, they're very uh, big in the Hispanic world. Tampico was started by a local Chicago family and uh, their last name is Bowden. And they started it uh, about 35 years ago, and they make fruit juice concentrate. Okay. And they occupied these buildings in Chicago on the Chicago River. 
And they sold the company to the families that had a private equity group called the Mellons and the Rockefellers out of New York. Okay. <laughs> so now they, they get all this money and the, the, it's called AEA was the private equity group. And they leased back the building from the family. They're actually the buildings. There were multiple buildings. And because as they grew, they expanded into the buildings next door, which is what happens in industrial often. And so the family decided a few years ago to sell the buildings with the leases in place for Tampico. And I found it through a broker off market. And we bought the properties uh, on October 19th of last year, subject to these leases from this family. Now, they didn't have a mortgage. And I bought another building where they make uh, products, they, they manufacture safety equipment for the welding industry. And that's in Chicago also, also owned by a wealthy family. Guess what? No debt. Right. But the, the secret is to have a profession or a business and make a lot of money and then go into real estate. These guys are going into real estate to get rich in real estate with a ton of debt where they're taught, you can borrow all the way up. You can borrow 90%. I'll show you how. Those are the people who are getting hurt because they, they started in real estate on a shoestring and didn't have the staying power. And that's a, that goes against my grain. The way I learned was I made a living and then I started doing real estate. I didn't quit my job to go do real estate and leverage up. Right. And, and, and I think that's where you sometimes, you know, you, you, you hear some of these investors where the, they're deal junkies and they're trying to buy and grow so fast. And to do that, in many cases, you've got to really, you got to, you got to be able to leverage heavily. Uh, and it sounds like you learned the art of raising capital, right? Yeah. I learned the art of building relationships, and that's the way that capital is raised, as you know. By the way, talking, talking about the word deal junkie, yeah. uh, you know my feeling about that. I, I believe that a lot of real estate people are nothing more the compulsive gamblers in their form of gambling instead of blackjack or craps or the horses or the sports, uh, their, their form of gambling is taking stupid risks in real estate without doing proper due diligence, without having experience, without having a mentor. And they, they are deal junkies and they want to build the number of doors. I want to have 3000 doors, Grant Cardone. You know what? That is bad. That's bad. Because you know that there are people who are stock traders, right? Yep. If you talk to any sophisticated billionaire who's made their money in the stock market, they're not traders. They were never traders. They are investors. So this is, this is my gut feeling. At least a third of the hot shot real estate guys are compulsive gamblers, and they ought to check in to Gamblers Anonymous and start go to meetings because if they do, they will find out that they have a lot in common with all the gamblers who needed to be big shots, had to drive a fancy car, had to get a fancy house, leveraged up everything. Right. I get it. There's, there's, there's a lot of philosophies about how to do things, but my investors and I don't believe in that. <laughs> we just don't believe in it. We're yeah. long-term holders. We invest. We don't speculate. And we want to make a really good yield. If I can't get them a seven and a half, eight percent yield, we skip the deal. And that's unleveraged. And we feel good about it. We sleep well at night. And I could talk all day about gambling. I've learned a hell of a lot about it. And all I need to do is meet a guy who's trying to increase the number of doors from 100 to 1,000, 10x, and I'll show you a compulsive gambler all day long. Yeah. You know, and you've touched on a couple of great points there, right? Yeah. Like the, that, the junkie mentality, it, 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 that's a mental, there's, there's, that's a mental health issue. Right? Is. We're talking about junkies here. And the other thing as well, too, is um, 
sleeping well at night. You know, that was one of the early uh, lessons that one of my early mentors taught me when I was, you know, I was leveraging at the time, you know, because I was in that nine to five world and that's what I knew. And, and so I did that, but he told me about interest rates and he goes, here's how you know what you should do, whether variable or fix is what allows you to sleep at night, you know, and, and that's good advice, you know, even with uh, some of the properties that I have, and there, there's still obviously leverage on it. However, last year in September, I made a difficult decision. And I locked everything in because I was like, I don't want to worry about that for the next few years. I'm an entrepreneur and there's other things that I can work on in, in my business. Right. And I think that's an, um, important to do. You are lucky. You're lucky. I'm not against people leveraging. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not an evangelist for debt-free deals. That's just what's good for me. Right. That's just good for my investors. Yeah. If, if I talk to somebody and they say, look, I, I've, I've got plenty of money. Let's talk about net worth, right? Your, your net worth when you take a lot of risk is your security blanket. Yeah. And when, when, I, when you're in the shower, I, I know a lot of people say when they're in the shower, they count them how much money they have in various places. It's like that's, they close their eyes and they feel good that they've got $5 million of net worth somewhere, okay. you know, whatever that may be. A lot of people have this in common. They, they do their numbers, right? I'm not against somebody who has a good net worth being in somewhat risky deals. You just can't put it all in risky deals. Right. There has to be a balanced portfolio, certain number of dollars in the stock market, bonds, maybe short term government, uh, treasury bills at this point, because rates are 5% today, and real estate, leveraged real estate, and maybe some safer real estate. You know, there, there are all these different ways of doing it. And my, my way of looking at it is everybody has the right to try to make a lot of money quickly by being lucky. I have a good friend. He got lucky. He bought Apple stock with all of his money when he came here from India. And today he's got more millions than most people have hundreds of thousands. And why? You know, he bought Apple. He was smart, but he, he did this because it was, um, at a young age, and he had the ability in case he lost the money, he had a job, he had the ability to uh, recover. But I know a guy that was 80 years old and took literally almost all of his money and bought a building and decided he was going to rehab it. It was one of these value adds. And the market turned in 2008 when he did it, and it, the market went against him. And he ended up losing the building and he guaranteed the loan and he had all these problems and he ended up having to move in with his children at age 80. He was a widower. His wife had died. Yeah. He died almost broke because he took so much risk. And it depends where you are in life. Really. It, it, that's a good point there. It does. You're right. It depends on where you are in life. You know, when I got into it, I got into real estate investing in 2008. And, uh, and you use the word luck. And we scaled our portfolio very quickly um, using a lot of leverage. And we got lucky. And, and, how, old, and how old were you? Uh, 34, 35. There you go. Right. So when you're 34, you can afford to take that kind of risk. Right. And when you're 54. Yeah. Nah. Exactly. And, and and that was what it was for me. It was like, I got lucky. You know, interest rates were low for a very long time. I ain't chancing it anymore. I'm good because I'm not trying to rebuild everything at, at you know, the, the close age of, of 50. Why, why, why go through all that? Right. So, yeah. And, and also you touched on something I think was really, really important is that, and I want to touch on this is, is, is mental health. Like how good does your mental health need to be when you're in this game of real estate investing or even being an entrepreneur? Yeah. Well, first of all, my mother's a therapist and she's in her late eighties, she still sees 12 people every week. My dad was a therapist. Yeah. My daughter is a therapist. Mental health is our family business. I just didn't go into it, but it's a, it's a really important thing. Having been through a severe depression, 
brought on by some decisions that I made that looking back, I, I, I had all this, you know, why do you go into a depression? You're ashamed, right? It's shame. Shame does it to you. And so to me, mental health stays good. If your judgment is good, you make your best decisions. And I try really hard to use good judgment with good advisors and thinking things through really, really well and doing due diligence really, really well and keeping my, uh, my debt to either a minimum or zero. It's not for everybody, but for my mental health, I can't be a gambler and be mentally healthy. Right. No, no, it makes sense. What, um, what are you paying attention to right now in the market where things are and, 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 and talking more from a macro standpoint, when you're looking at things in the U S things that are happening in the world, uh, you know, China and Russia and, um, you know, the wars that we're potentially going into, are you still investing and, and what are you looking at in, in, in regards to investing and, and how are you making those decisions moving forward? Because I think the way things are, that can really freeze you it can, and it can make you not do anything because you're always waiting or you're on the sidelines, you know, waiting for this game of double dutch. When should I jump in? Yeah, so I, I will answer that with I am laser focused on one thing. Class B, small industrial buildings that average $3 million each. Occupied manufacturer by manufacturing companies in Chicago, period. So knowing my market, and I, and I can get into what I advise my mentees, which is to find one thing and be the greatest at it. Because I know my market so well, there's 15,000 buildings that I've been to here out of the 16,000 industrial buildings in Chicago. So I've been to 90 something percent of those buildings in my career. I know the market cold. When you know your market cold, you know the good things and the bad things. There's always deals somewhere. It's harder to find them in these times when it looks like things could just go to hell in a handbasket. So we're careful. We're not closed for business. We're buying a building uh, next month that's occupied by a company called Talkaphone. And we're buying it from the family that started the business. They make those emergency phones that you see at hospitals, parking garages, university campuses. And they're owned by a private equity group. And I'm buying it. Why? It's an 8% return, no debt, good tenant. And I think I'm buying it at a discount to the future price that I might sell it for to a local user not an investor, but a local user who might be down the street from this building and needs to expand their business into another building nearby. Total value, $2 million. So I'm not getting in over my head, no debt, know the market, laser focus, lease to a good tenant. And yes, I will do deals even when it looks like there might be World War III. Because otherwise, you're sitting on cash, and it's doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right. Yeah, you're sitting on cash, not doing nothing, or, or you're sitting there worrying about, uh, you know, should I go build a bunker? I've, I've been there before. <laughs> and, I, I know, and, I, and I get to the point, of like, I, I can't think like that. You know, I, I've, I've got to I've gotta get out of that mindset because um, it, it just freezes you. And, uh, and then you start making uh, bad decisions. Because you need a moat. You don't need a bunker, but you need a moat. Yes. You got to be protected in some way where you have an edge over other people, where you're taking less risk to make more money because you're good at it. And, and I, I believe that that's your philosophy. I mean, give me, give me an example of why you're doing your next deal. I'm doing my next deal because I can now negotiate again. You know, we were in this market where it was this fear of missing out and I need to get in. And then I started getting tips from my, uh, my barber or, uh, <laughs> you know, people that just weren't in real estate that all of a sudden thought that uh, real estate investing was, uh, was easy. 
Uh, and now that you've seen that, uh, people have seen that it's not, uh, this is what, you know, it, and that's unfortunate, but it's, it's a cleansing of the market. And this happens uh, from time to, you know, in that cycle. And so now I feel like there's time that now I, I can negotiate again. And that's a good place to be. I just kind of take a look at fundamentals. And then also number two would be, you know, what, what, what's a good asset to go into, whether good times or bad times. Right. And a lot of yeah. it's, you know, for me, yeah. it's residential. It's, you know, people always need a roof over their heads. Between Canada and the U.S., I have done a little bit of an analysis, just trying to figure out how many syndicators there are, how many people are buying real estate, not just with their own money, but bringing in a partner or multiple partners or a group of partners. Mm -hmm. And I have estimated that there are about 4,000 real syndicators in North America. Might be wrong, might be 5,000, might be 3,000, but that, that's, that's my estimate. And we know a lot of them. You and I both do. You know, you and I both have done the podcast circuit for a while. And there are thousands of um, guests and, and uh, people who've been interviewed on podcasts or have written articles or who send out emails every day. Some of them are very, very large and have billions of dollars. Some of them are very, very small, like us, like we are. We've got a very small portfolio. We have 19 buildings that adds up to $70 million at this point. It's very small. We're, there's four syndicators who do industrial in Chicago, and we're the smallest of the four. Um, and I would say of the 4,000, I would... I'm I'm going to just, I can't say for sure, but I'm going to guess that at least half of them have at least one or more bad deals where they're scared shitless. What, within the last couple of years? Within the last six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have some really close friends who are brilliant operators. They got trouble. They had floating rate debt. They, they had during COVID, if you had B minus properties during COVID, being truthful, there were tenants who didn't pay rent and you couldn't throw them out in most, uh, in most municipalities and most states because of the laws, they were protected. And then their next door neighbor would find out that they weren't paying and they'd call and say, hey, I can't pay, even right. though they could. And so you could, you could lose in a multifamily deal, you could lose 20, 25% of your rent because of bad tenants while rates are shooting up and you have no protection because your your rate caps got obliterated and you can't refi. So I think of the of the let's call it 4000 syndicators, at least a couple thousand of them are struggling with something like I did back in 08. And a lot of them are handling it as best they can, but it's hard because they're, they're looking for rescue money and MES money and bridge money. And they're going to their investors and trying to do capital calls. And they're saying, we can't do distributions anymore. The reason I like my all cash deals, that can't happen. Right. You own the building uh, as opposed to them being over leveraged. It can't happen. There's no rate. There's no rate. If you have no rate, the rate can't go up. And what's really interesting about it is it's hard as hell to raise more money. So that's the problem is that I now have to, instead of on a $3 million deal coming up with 750, which would be 25% and leveraging at 75%, so easy to call my banker, Jay Dice, it's Joel. I need to borrow two and a quarter million. Oh, no problem. They're happy to give it to you, but they have no sense of humor when you can't pay them back. Right. Well, Jay does. But most banks don't. Chase doesn't, and Wells Fargo doesn't, and most local banks don't, and the banks are having trouble. So my whole philosophy on this, Gary, is that for me, no debt is what's keeping my mental health and my money safe. It's not for everybody. I get it. But um I just feel so bad for the people struggling with these things because that's where I was. I, yeah. I totally understand it. 
Right. Yeah. So uh, hopefully they've got a couch like yours in the back. And uh, in a few years, they will learn that lesson, unfortunately, but it'll make them better and hopefully stronger, right? Right. Well, they, they need a, a good therapist. <laughs> Actually, they, you know a few. <laughs> they can call my daughter. They can call my mother. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And I still go, I go every other week to someone that I talk to. I talk business and I talk personal. I see them every other Saturday and it's extremely important. And I've, I've learned about meditation. I've done some of that. I do a lot of journaling, but the mental health thing is, is such a major component. You know, you're so right. Yeah. Where do you see things going the next year or two? Do you, do you see it getting worse? Um, you know, I, I listened to a podcast and, and watched the YouTubes of a guy named Adam Taggart. You got to listen to this guy. All right. Uh, he's got 80,000 views every, every uh, time he comes on and he yep. interviews economists and economic researchers and money managers and advisors. It's called thoughtful money. Okay. And I'll check it out. It's great, but I'll watch it working out on a Wednesday night. And he's got this, this Stephanie Pomboy who everybody respects. And she says the world's coming to an end and then he'll have somebody else. Uh, Lance Roberts, who's an advisor, and he says, yeah, things are going to keep going up. Maybe it'll go down. And then you get somebody else, this guy who's in Dubai that's sitting there smoking a cigarette, giving his advice to Adam. And he says, oh, the market's going to keep going because and they all have reasons. They all sound like they know exactly what they're talking about. They're so confident. And they're saying the opposite things of each other. Right. So I can only say, I don't know. I can only do what I do. If I was a doctor and my specialty was doing what my mother had done a couple of weeks ago, which was having one kidney with kidney cancer taken out. And I was a doctor who been, who's been taking out kidneys and doing surgery on kidneys. They're called a urologist and they, they can do prostate and other stuff. If I do nothing but that, I'm making a great living. I'm helping people and it doesn't matter if the interest rates go up or down unless I invested with someone who took a lot of risk. And that specialty allows him to go to sleep at night knowing that he's helping people and he's not taking an inordinate amount of risk, but he's really good at what he does. And he's confident in his ability to do what he does every day without feeling like he's a gambler. All right. So I look at that. I, I compare, I compare every, when I invest in someone else's syndication, I look at them. I say, first of all, what's your succession plan? Because if you die, I better be happy with the person that takes your place. And people who don't ask me that don't know that that's the most important question. Yeah. That's number one. You know, number yeah. yeah, I think really what it comes down to what you're saying is, again, it comes down to what allows you to sleep at night. You know, I think that's really important yeah. and, and making sure that you're protecting your your clients, your investors and the people that are doing business with you. You know, there's a lot of obviously lawsuits that are happening up here. And uh, and I sent uh, an article over to my partners uh, and I and I said, because we're moving into the U.S. And I said, listen, this 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 go through this and let's pay attention so that this does not happen to us or anybody right. that we partner with. This is a yeah. good learning lesson, right? And, and let's make sure that we're protecting everyone that goes into, into business with us. It's very important, you know? It is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe that there's one major thing that's the most important. And it's, it's in a book um, that I love. It's called The Four Agreements. Mm -hmm. by you know the book by Ruiz. Yeah, I don't remember. What, I don't remember the agreements. I did hear them. Do, do you remember them? Yeah. Yeah. Be impeccable with your word. Yeah. That's really important. Uh, don't make assumptions. You, you know, assumptions ruin everybody. When you make assumptions, it, it can cause a war. It can cause a divorce. It can cause your kids to hate you. You can't make an assumption. You, right. just, you just can't do it. And and really. Um, not taking anything personally. You can't take things personally. You have to let, you have to be forgiving and let things roll off. 
to be happy, I think. Yeah. And lastly, do your best. If you're doing your best, if I run into someone who's not doing their best, usually it's because they have some addiction problem and or they've got a mental problem or they've got a self-esteem problem. Someone who's not doing their best um, can't feel good. Yeah. But those are the people who are ashamed. Yeah. Thanks for sharing the four agreements. And, and you're so right. You know, I remember um, when I was at TD uh, and uh, TD Bank and I was, uh, I was trying to figure out how do I get out of this nine to five job? Cause I just didn't like it anymore. And I remember talking to a couple of coworkers and I said, man, I can't wait till I retire. <laughs> Holy, what like talk about a horrible outlook of your life that I can't wait till I'm 65 years old. Yeah. And, 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 and if you, if you can use those words and look at yourself in the mirror and use that as fuel, cause that was disgust. I was actually disgusted with where I was in my life. And so instead of feeling depressed, I said, I'm going to use this and, and use it as rocket fuel to get me out of where I am and go and spend time with people that are where I want to be. And that's, yeah. that's really how I changed my life. Instead of sitting there complaining with everybody else, uh, I went and started hanging out with, uh, you know, people that, that were making changes in their lives. Yeah. I, I have, I wrote an article that I've never published. I just wrote it <laughs> and it's got, I call it, uh, what I've learned. Number one is do what you love, do what you love, figure it out. If it's music, do it, figure out a way to be in music. You know, if it's, uh, being in real estate, do it. You know, if it's going back to law school, medical school, whatever it is, my dad changed his career. He hated what he did. And I learned from him. He worked for my uh, mother's family. They had a women's clothing store and he hated it. And when I was a kid, he went back to school and he got his PhD, his master's and his PhD in psychology, which that became the family business. Um, and he loved what he did. But until then, he was miserable. So love what you do. And here's the second one that a lot of people don't get and don't agree with. Never fully retire. Mm. And that's never partially retire. But if you love what you do, you're not retiring because you love what you do. You're already better than retired. Right. So that's, and, and the third one is don't, don't be a big shot because if you're making a lot of money and you think it's going to happen forever, that's not really true. And if people live beyond their means excessively to impress other people, that is a formula for failure and disaster, including your ego being smashed. Because I think most people who go out and live way beyond their means do it because they were never educated because nobody teaches you how to live your lifestyle. There's some books about it and there's people who talk about it, but that's the third thing. And I'm guilty in 2008, I was one big shot of a guy. <laughs> I was really. I was so stupid. You know, I had, I was at a country club and I thought I could use another country club. You know, yeah, I, I, it was beyond what I should have been thinking about. And, you know, I've heard people say, I, I went on a vacation with my family and I put it on the credit card and I didn't know how I was going to pay for it, but I'm making memories. You know, you know, those guys. And, yeah. and I, love, I love those guys. They're, they're right. But it's a dangerous way to live. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's a good reminder, even for myself, you know, uh, and I, and I think out of this podcast, that's, that is probably one of my favorite things that you said, because it, it allows me to also even put myself in check as well too. And I think that's why I enjoy doing these shows is that, you know, I always leave uh, most of these shows where I'm like, ah, that's a good, that's a good reminder, Gary you know, and then, and then put it in my tool belt and, and try not to forget it because you can get caught up in it very quickly and like, okay, we're going to do this and I got to do this and I, I got to build this. And, I, and all of a sudden now you're trying to create this empire and you don't need to. And I think if you kind of pull back and take a look at it and say, how can I help other people? And I think if you continue to do that with, with, with laser focus to, to truly want to help other people see themselves better than how they are, I think that's ultimately, I think probably that's why we're here. 
It's number one. I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. I think that is the wisest thing that people tell each other as a value. And I think that you've hit it just the nail right on the head. Yeah. Awesome. Joel, listen, I, I really appreciate your time today. I do. I think, uh, I think people will get some good value out of this. Um, before we wrap it up, what's the, what's the best day of your life and maybe one of the worst days of your life? Well, my two younger children are going to be really upset that I'm saying that the best day of my life was when my first daughter was born. I was very happy when my second daughter and my son were born too, but there was never an elation, like becoming a dad for the first time. Uh, that was the best one. Yeah. Uh, the worst one, I, I don't really think I had a worst day. I've had a lot of bad days. I've, I've lost people who are loved ones and those are all equally bad. Right. Those are the ones that are the worst for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I could, uh, I can relate to that as well too. I've had, uh, had some tragic losses, but it also allows you, I think, to remember how short this ride is. Yes. All right. And to, and to enjoy it, enjoy every day. Yeah. I, I think, listen, I've listened to you. I, I like your insights on life very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that's why I've got you here as well, too, because I've listened to you as well, too, and I've, I've enjoyed your insights as well. So, Joel, thank you very much. If people want to learn more about you or maybe uh, potentially, uh, you know, do some business with you as well, too, how can they, uh, how can they get a hold of you? Our website is BritProperties.com, B-R-I-T with one T, Properties. Awesome. Joel, again, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, uh, and I hope to see you in, in person one day. Thanks, Gary. Did All I? right. You take care.